Here we are again, folks. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. If you follow uh, some of the tidbits that I have, you probably have already gathered that I'm kind of an Old Testament buff, and I am. But I also know the New Testament, and I know the New Testament is for us today. Even though I know the Old Testament is actually, uh, the New Testament is almost like an overlay or a copy of the Old Testament. If you know the Old Testament and you know the New Testament and you know God's law and what God planned and everything, the answer to the Old Testament is the New Testament and the answer to the New Testament is the Old Testament. Both of them are answer sheets for each other. It's kind of a, a conundrum in a sense. It's like a circle, but the top half, this half right here, belongs to this half right here. And you can't have the whole circle without having them both. And you have to have them both to have the whole circle. Uh, all the Old Testament talks about from, uh, from Adam on is Jesus Christ coming. And that's what he talks about. And then when Jesus comes, the, it talks about what God did and what God planned and what God had in purpose for those who was his before the New Testament and how they rebelled and how they did and how they are our example of what happens if we rebel and if we don't do what God would have us do. Now, let's look at chapter 8 of Romans. Now, after a man says, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. After he says that, I have this little track. This little track says, in it, it says the first thing it says <clears throat> in Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's word is clear. All mankind has sinned before the righteous God. Everyone has fallen short of God's standards. And the second thing it says, for the wages of sin is death. What is wages? Wages is payment. So if you are a continual habitual sinner, your payment is death. You say, well, Pete, everybody's going to die. Yes, they are. Even the righteous man is going to die in the flesh one time. But the death he's talking about here is total separation from God for eternity. Being totally separated from God for eternity. Now, wages means payment. The Bible said all sin leads to death. But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sons, Christ died for us. Can you imagine a man allowing himself to be hung on a cross and shed his blood for you and I when we were in our sin? He knew that the whole world was lying in sin because Adam had sinned and sin was passed on and that's uh, to all men. So God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, died for our sins. Jesus made the payment for you and for me. <clears throat> but the gift of God is eternal life. Now it's a gift. We get it by requesting it. Saying, Lord, I do want the gift of eternal life. Thank you. I know you're holding it out to give me. And I thank you for it. At 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972, a drunk man I was. And out there and crashed my car. And I got out of the car and the Lord knocked on my heart and said, you're nervous up, Pete. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Come in my heart and save my soul. He did. A lot of people say, Pete, is it that simple? Yes, it is. If it wasn't that simple, uh, I, an ignorant man couldn't do it. If it wasn't that simple, uh, a child couldn't do it. If it was by baptism, those who couldn't get baptized couldn't get saved. If it was by any other thing but just a request, yes, I want that gift. Jesus is holding that gift out of eternal life. And all you have to do is ask for it. God's gift to you was His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus who died on the cross for you and is the same Jesus who gives you eternal life. And He is the same Jesus. If you will confess with your mouth, He will come in your heart. And in thine heart, God hath raised Him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. If you'll say this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is possible only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Bible says you can be saved. 
for whosoever. That's anybody. That's the drunk, the thief, the murderer, the whoremonger, the rapist, the child pornographer, the everybody, anybody who gives up what they are and says, I will call upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Whosoever, your God desires fellowship with you. After that, <clears throat> your sins are cast into the sea of forgetfulness, never more to be remembered, not ever to be brought back up to you by God. People will bring them back up, but God will not. God never intended for salvation to be difficult. It's not difficult. It is easy. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you want to know him today as your Savior? Just pray this simple prayer from your heart to God. God, I know I am a sinner. I want Jesus to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Save my soul in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that, or you're going to do that, you will be saved. You will go to heaven when you die. But then there is an important thing. After salvation, it's just like being birthed from your mother's womb. You had to have some milk. You need to get a Bible out, and you need to get some milk of the Word. You need to go sit in a church house somewhere and listen to a preacher expound the Word. Better than that, you need to start at Sunday school in whatever church you go to find out what time Sunday school is. Find a Sunday school class. Get in it. And you'll be with a group of people that will help you get in, get oriented, and really get into what you're going to do in your new life. And get a Bible, a good Bible. Don't get a, and not get a King James Version Bible. Don't get any other one. Get a King James Version Bible and start there. You won't go wrong, I'll guarantee it. <clears throat> you will be labeled a King James person. That's good. That's a good label. I wear that label until I die and I will not back up, and I will not change for any other reason. I have read the other translations, and they are versions that are translated from the King James, and they're changed. And God has a great thing to say about that. Look, now, chapter 8 of Romans, listen to what he's saying. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. My life was the beer joint. My life was living in the beer joint. Now my life is living in the righteous place, in the church. And yours will be too. <clears throat> when you ask Jesus to save you, get on, get in, and go. Uh, it's just like if you bought a car, would you leave it in the parking lot and walk home? No. No. You'll drive that car home, and you'll drive it every day, and it'll get you where you want to go. That's just like the Word of God. Now that you got in, and you got saved, or you've been in, and you've been saved, but you haven't been in the Word, it's just like you're more important than your car in a big sense of the Word. You need to get in it for a daily basis. It's what's going to carry you hour by hour through the day. It's what's going to carry you when you are in your car. It's going to carry you there and back in, at being in the Word of God. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The minute I got saved, I have not from that day forward to this day, and that was in November 5, 1972 at 3 in the morning, to this day, I have not swore a cuss word, and I swore like a parrot before. I have not drank a drop of liquor. It took me a year to get cigarettes out of my life. I'm still working on some things that are in my life that are plagues, but I'm a human being. I was born of a human man that had human problems, and his father had human problems, and his father had human problems, and it goes all the way back to Adam, and so we all will have human failures. But we need to get over those and go forward. All right. Made free for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. Sin in the flesh. What is sin in the flesh? A foul mouth. Bad words. I've had some real good 
Christian friends in my life since I've been saved that I uh, hadn't learned that it's not uh, Christian-like to say many words, uh, many of the words today that are disgusting. Uh, and you don't say those words if you're a Christian. If you walk up on a, a crowd and they're telling a dirty joke, you don't stop and listen. You get on out of the way. And you will hear somebody say, that's that Holy Joe. He don't, he don't listen to this kind of stuff. That's good. That's good. You're not supposed to listen to it. You are supposed to be in the world but separated from the world. In the world but not of the world. Just a few minutes ago before you got saved, if you got saved, uh, or if you are saved, you were in the world and of the world. But now you're in the world but not of the world. Now you're in the world but of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is opposite from what's in the world. So therefore, it said, for what the law couldn't do because it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. <coughs> now if Jesus, you ask him, come in my heart and save my soul, he did. Now he's inside of your flesh making you a flesh of a heavenly kingdom. You now have a soul that is saved and in heavenly places. Listen to this, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now what you need to do is get a Bible, get out, get started, find a church. Find a church somebody else talks about, everybody talks about. You could say to me this, and I have people say it every day. Matter of fact, I want a 78-year-old man to the Lord last week, 78 years old. He's been in the church his whole life, the same church his whole life, and never heard that plan of God, the gospel, the plan of salvation. He's heard singing, he's heard all kinds of praying, he's heard all kinds of stuff, but he himself was never asked to ask God to forgive him of his sin, come in his heart and save his soul. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And the uh, all right. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. It's growth. You gotta learn, you gotta grow. I told you a little while ago when you got born from your mother's womb, you got fed milk. So you gotta find a Bible, you gotta drink a little milk. You gotta start going to a church, go to a Sunday school class and get a little milk. And, and, then, and then one day, you'll be able to eat a little pavlin. You'll be able to eat a little solid, a little solid food like applesauce, ground up apple. It's just like eating the whole great big apple, but you can't bite it off because you're not able yet. So you're fed it all ground up. It's the same thing, but in a different form. And as you start, you'll start small. For to be kindly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Would you like life and peace in your life? Would you actually like life and peace in your life? You know what you got to do? You got to jump in the water with both feet. I, when I was young, I used to see people come stick their toe in. Oh, it's cold! And they wouldn't get in. I run down off that rock, man, and jump. And, and I lived in Maine, the water was 58 degrees, <laughs> freezing cold. But once you jumped in all the way, it wasn't bad. You'd come up in a couple minutes, you, you were fine, you were adjusted to it. And that's what you have to do with a spiritual life. You've got to jump in with both feet, all the way in, and get in there, all the way over your head, and then you've got to stay. You've got to stay in. Do not pay attention to whims and things off the wall. Pay attention to the word. And look, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. Why? Because it wants to think it knows something that it don't. It wants to think it knows more than God. Carnal minded people want to tell God what they know or want or, or, or what God should do. 
instead of listening to God with a spiritual mind and doing what he says do. And that's the opposite of the two. So then they are of the flesh cannot please God. So if you're living in a fleshly way and saying, well, I'm smart enough to do it. Listen, I got a college education. I got a PhD and a DDD and a so and so and so and so. I got news for you. You can have all the D&Ds and all of the stuff you want. It won't get you to heaven. It will not get you to heaven. Education will not get you to heaven. You can be the smartest, brain-wise human being on the earth, and you still won't even amount to a speck according to the brain and heart of God. You won't be a speck. You wouldn't be a molecule. By the way, you can't make a molecule. How about that? And God can take them all and put them together and make things with them. All right. So then they that are in the flesh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you've never said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul, you're not his. I don't care how educated you are. You may know this Bible from cover to cover. You might can quote it. You might even been preaching for a lot of years. But if you haven't asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and come in your heart and save your soul, you ain't going to heaven. You're on your way to hell. Intelligence is not spirituality. Spirituality is a gift from God. And that's what it is. And you can be dumb as a rock and be spiritual. You don't have to know a whole lot to be spiritual. A six-year-old child that asks God to save him and starts following the Lord, he, he doesn't know enough to know how to do things. Yet God accepts him just like he does a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old. All right. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we live in a deadly fleshly body. A dead fleshly body. Yes, this body can move. Yes, it can do many things. But as far as God's concerned, the flesh cannot please God. The things that I do with this body, unless I'm following the Spirit to do them, uh, won't please God. So I have to follow the Spirit to do them, to please God. All right. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, God quickened my body. Instead of my body going to the beer joint, I go to the church house. Instead of my body smoking them cigarettes, I read the scripture and follow the Lord. Instead of my body doing many things of the world, by the way, you're listening to, I'm 72 years old sitting here in front of you. I work every day, hard. I leave at 6.30 in the morning, get back late in the evening. I work every day hard. Why? I'm physically fit. Why? I tithe. Tithe. What is a tithe? Tithe is 10% of every single dollar that you make and has been ever since I got saved in 1972. And God has honored it. And he's blessed it. And he will bless you. Once you are now saved, your fleshly body that goes to work every day, that draws a paycheck at the end of the week, is supposed to do what the spiritual inside tells it to do, and that is take $10 out of every hundred and put it in the offering plate. It belongs to God. This is not your money. This is God's money. It is not your money. So you need to take it and uh, put it where it belongs. The best thing to do is when you get your check and you come home or your wife and you put it down or whatever, you take that tithing money, put it in a tithing envelope, and take it down to the church you belong to. By the way, that's one of the first things you've got to do. Find a church to get into after you get saved. 
And like I say, find one that the Lord is in. Find one that in town. There's a lot of controversy about it because it is a spiritual church. Find one that has a bus route where it goes and picks up kids and people talk about it because they say, well, they give them kids bubble gum and cakes and cookies and all kinds of stuff and entice them to come to church. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do it for a reason so that we may be able to work with that soul of that child and keep him from going to jail or prison when he's 17 years old or 18 years old or younger even today. And uh, it's worth it. The Bible says go out in the highways and hedges and compel, compel, compel. You know what policemen do when they compel you? They twist your arm up behind you and pull up on it a little bit. That's how they compel you to get in the police car. And that's what the word compel means, to twist your arm. Ah, all right. The body is dead. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. I can cause myself a horrendously tough day, week, month, year, whatever, in my life if I yield to the flesh. If I yield to the flesh, I can cause myself much grief and that is a separation from God for a period of a day even, an hour, a week, a minute or two, or whatever. If I do commit a sin, that immediately God strikes my heart and says, Whoa, you shouldn't have said that. You need to go tell that man, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm a Christian, I, I, I shouldn't have got upset. You need to take care of that. And I take care of it, and bam, I'm back again spiritually right. But we can grieve the Lord. The Bible says, grieve not the spirit that is in you that you are sealed by until the day of redemption. So don't grieve that spirit that you are sealed by until the day of redemption. And keep that right in your life. And the spirit of God. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye then, the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For ye have not received the Spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When Jesus comes into your heart, he will, he will immediately show you that your spirit has changed. He will do things for you that you will not believe. Do you know that you can be a dope addict? And God can deliver you instantly from dope? I'm talking about instantly. I have no faith in these programs that feed you more dope to weed you off the dope that you're on and leaves you on another dope. It's like I, when I'm talking about cigarettes, I talk about cigarettes. They're liars. Cigarettes are liars. They say, if you smoke me, I will satisfy you. For how long? Ten minutes? And then you've got to have another one that says the same thing. If you smoke me, I'll satisfy you. For how long? Ten minutes? And then uh, ten minutes later, another one, and another one, another one. That's all you're getting if you go to a program that weeds you off from dope. With dope, you are going to be still a dope addict in a different form. And a light of weight, maybe. And they're going to give you a bunch of medicine. They say, now we'll give you this medicine. We'll give you a prescription. You can get this every month filled. And you take it. That's a smaller form of the same thing. No. You need to get clean. Get off it. You need to say, God, you deliver me from it. You deliver me from the desire of it. 
and the fleshly desire will leave you. By the way, he says in verse 17, and if you are children, then you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. If so be that you suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. What kind of suffering is he talking about? He's talking about the ridicule of the world. He's talking about separating yourself from what some of the world calls pleasures. Many of the pleasures of this world are heathen pleasures and stuff. I can't go to the movie hall. Why couldn't I go to the movie hall? You say, well, they're going to show a good movie today today. Yeah, but they're also going to show 30 minutes of nasty, rotten, dirty, cussing, swearing, naked previews of other pictures. Do you think I'm going to go set through 30 minutes of people cussing at me, running around naked, doing things that are opposite of what God, so that I could watch one good movie? No. It doesn't, the good doesn't outweigh the bad there. The bad outweighs the good. Listen, your mind is not a trash can. Your heart is not a trash can. You can't feed yourself with that junk. Now you are a child of God, glorified together with Him. And if you're children, then you are with Him. You may also be glorified with Him. For I reckon the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Listen. It's so stupid in my mind, in my heart, to think that I was living a good life before I got saved. I sat on Suicide Hill three times before I got saved. I was on Suicide Hill three times. I was on Suicide Hill before I got saved. Yet, I thought I was having pleasure every day, getting drunk every day, cussing, swearing, running, rambling, being unhappy, not being able to make anything work. Do you know I didn't make any more pay after I got saved than I made before I got saved? But the pay that I made after I got saved worked fine. Worked fine the rest of my life. It didn't pay. It worked good. But oh, I couldn't get out of debt but before I was saved. Oh, one thing is when I got saved I had a thousand dollar or more beer bill. Look a bill with a place. I had to go borrow the money and pay it off so that it wouldn't be on me. And, and got rid of it. So we need to uh, go all the way when we go. We need to get out and get in. Get out of that life and get in the new life. Now I reckon that the suffering of this world not worthy to be compared revealed us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's quite a heavy verse. But what he's saying is God is waiting to see you manifest in your life the manifestations of God. In your life you will grow up and manifest the manifestations of God. You will put away the manifestations of the devil and you will put on the manifestations of God. You will quit lying, cheating, stealing, robbing, uh, drinking, cussing, You'll quit doing those things. You quit doping and doing all of those things. Will be able to be. You'll be able to be delivered from them. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. I have a glorious liberty in God. A glorious liberty I have in God. Where before I had no liberty. None. And everything I did was heathen. Now we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit even unto ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of God. Listen, we are now adopted into the kingdom of God. We now can go with Him to heaven. We now can have some of that heavenly stuff here 
on the earth. Well, my time's come and gone. We'll see you next time. Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word.